Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're glad to have you worshiping with us today in the house of the Lord. I am proud to introduce Randy Ernst and his wife. He will be leading worship for us today. Good morning, everybody. We uh, have some songs that are not in the hymn book today. I hope you'll forgive me for that. Why don't we all stand and sing the song, In Christ Alone. I'm pretty sure that's going to make it into the hymn book one of these days. See, if you don't come to church, we just keep going. Amen? Amen. Here we go. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. Firm to the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when thriving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand in Christ alone. of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. Was laid here in the death of Christ. I live there in the ground, his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory. Its grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry to final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Nathaniel, if you'll hold that last verse on there, we're going to turn around, shake hands with somebody, make them feel welcome in church today. Of all places to feel welcome, it ought to be in church. Amen? We're going to play through this, and then we'll sing that last verse again. Be seated. 
How many of you have never heard that song before? Raise your hand. Never heard it before. You just did. I love that. I get somebody every time on that. Some of these songs, I don't know if you folks know them, but if you don't, just sing along. The Lord said make a joyful noise. He didn't say you'd have to be on tune or know the words. Amen? Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in for his love for me. Oh, it's love. children of God, we have something to shout about, don't we? Amen. Amen. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of Let every breath, all that I have. 
days I want to praise the wonders of your so I can't hear the organist, so if she's messing up, you let me know. <laughs> this is my wife, Tawana. We are thrilled to be back with you. We were here last year at this time, and I was honored that Pastor asked us to come back and fill in for him while he's at camp. So we'll be praying for him while he's there and his family, and we'll be having a good time here. He probably should have stuck around because we're going to have a good time here. <laughs> you were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, O oh Christ. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great. Your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is, what a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the boss of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Do the bridge again. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of
What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. singing this morning. Are you full of peace and joy? I just had it. Is this bottle full? Not now. And even when they sell it to you, it only comes to about right there. So it's really not full, is it? But if I were to take the cap off, take it home, put it on the table, put a lot of, uh, oh, I've got to put this on, don't I? The wonders of modern technology. The wonder is it only works if you use it. <laughs> See if I can do this by myself. In our church, every Sunday, my wife has to put this on me because I'm just inept. I have to have you. <laughs> This Sunday, too. Testing one, two. Am I on? No. Now I should be on. Am I on? There we go. All right. So if I were to take this home, put a couple towels under it, because <clears throat> you know it's going to happen, and I take another bottle of Diet Coke, and I pour it in there until it overflows, then it's full, right? So using the bottom of the bottle to overflowing. Do you have joy and peace this morning to the point where it is overflowing? And only you can answer that question. And it's, it is a rhetorical question. Don't answer me. But that is my hope for every Christian is that they would be full of joy and peace. You ever notice people want to be happy? Have you ever seen a commercial on TV? Buy our product now. It's on sale. It will make you totally miserable and you will hate your life. That's not how they advertise, is it? Oh man, you got to buy this thing because if you do, it's so awesome. You'll be so happy. I'm always happy when we get a new car, which isn't very often. But the whole time you're driving that new car, you're just babying it. You park way out in the Meyer parking lot. And when you come out, some joker has pulled right up next to you, this close to you, and has left a door ding in your brand new car. So I, I'm always happy for people who get a new car, and when they drive it to church and they park it way far away, I say, hey, new car, great. You're really uh, anticipating that first scratch, aren't you? And they say, oh, yeah, I dread that first scratch. I said, let me just take care of it for you. I'll just go do it right now. Just put a ding in it. Now you don't have to be concerned about it. You can park it anywhere. Nobody advertises, you'll hate it. You'll be miserable if you buy this. Man, get this product, and when you eat it, it'll taste horrible in your mouth, and you'll want to throw up. They always go the reverse, don't they? You'll be so happy. And they may not come out and say, you'll be so happy, but the whole thing is they've got a pretty girl. You ever notice they don't use ugly girls for advertisement? Or ugly men? Or like old fat guys like me? You'll never see me in a TV commercial. No, if you drink this beer, it'll make you look gorgeous. There's a difference between happiness and joy. And that's what we want to talk about today. If I can get through it, I sang too loud. Sorry. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we love you. We thank you for this opportunity to open your word and to look into it, to be encouraged, to be equipped to do your will. My Father, I pray that you'd bless everyone who has come. 
I pray that you would open their heart to receive your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I really did a job on my voice singing those songs. <laughs> well, that part did. The sermon's going to be horrible, but at least the music went well. Amen. How is it possible for people to have joy in the middle of heartache and pain? How is it possible to be joyful when your whole world around you is collapsing? One of the gentlemen that we got to meet on this trip to Michigan from God's paradise, Florida, I'm having withdrawal symptoms because there are no palm trees here. But one of the things that we'd planned to do is to go see Tawana's former youth pastor. And we made plans to see him and Linda. And we left. When did we leave? What day did we leave to come up here? And two days before we left to come up here, Linda died. And yet when we met with, with David, yes, he's grieving. Yes, he misses his wife horribly. But there is a joy about him because he has the joy of the Lord in his heart. And he draws his strength from that joy. And the Lord did not put us down here to leave us wallowing around in our sorrow. He put us here so that we could have joy. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to break this verse down with you today. May the God of hope, <clears throat> Psalm 65, 5 says, You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds, God our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. Think of that. The hope of all the ends of the earth. That's a lot of hope and of the farthest seas. He is the God of hope. In Psalm 146, 5, he said, Blessed are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. You see, you can find happiness, and happiness will last for a little while, but it's fleeting when you do get that new car, yep, yeah, you feel good. You've got a smile on your face. Oh, everything smells so good. Everything works. The engine light is not on. Good for 36,000 miles, or if you buy a Hyundai, 100,000 miles. Or I guess it's a Kia. And it's so nice and pretty, and you want to keep it washed, and it makes you happy. But after a few dings and scratches and flat tires and you missed an oil change and you got a knock in the motor, it's not so, it's just not so happy, is it? It's fleeting. Happiness is not permanent. And that's why the advertisers have to keep advertising. We have to keep consuming, keep buying new things, keep going to things that provide happiness. But joy is eternal. Joy will get you through the sorrow and the heartache and the tough times. Jeremiah 14, 22 <clears throat> says, Do any of the worthless idols of the nations bring rain? Do the skies themselves send down showers? No, it is you, our Lord God. Therefore, our hope is in you, for you are the one who does all this. Is there a fire? I'm the first one out if there's a fire. <laughs> I love y'all, but every man for himself, and I'm near that door. <clears throat> Romans 5, 1 through 6 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, and that's 
That's interesting. Let's, let's do a little rabbit trail right there. If you plan it, it's not a rabbit trail. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Do you realize that most of the world's religions today teach you that if you're good outweighs your bad, then you get to go to heaven. Most of the world's religions teach that. Most of Christian denominations, when you boil it all down, it's based on works, not on faith, and not on his righteousness, but your righteousness. We're told in Timothy, it's not on my righteousness by which I've been saved, it's by his mercy He has saved us. When we put our faith and our trust and our hope in Jesus Christ, the one who paid our sin debt on the cross, he saves us by his mercy and covers our sin with his blood that he shed. And aren't you glad that it's a simple plan of salvation? It's so simple that my wife accepted Jesus as her Savior when she was four years old. I accepted Jesus when I was seven because I didn't have all the questions that a lot of adults have. Well, yeah, but, you know, what about this and what about that? Rather, when presented with the gospel, Jesus died for your sins and He promises to take you to heaven if you put your faith and your trust in him and the work that he did on Calvary, on the cross. And he rose from the dead. And if you believe that, you'll be saved from hell. You get to go to heaven when you die. Do you want to do that? And as a little kid, yeah. Except for one little boy. He was on the front row and the pastor was preaching about going to heaven. And he got a little emotional. He said, it's going to be a beautiful place. It's wonderful. It's fantastic. We can't even imagine how wonderful heaven is going to be. How many of y'all want to go to heaven? And everybody raised their hand except this little boy. And he thought, well, maybe he's, maybe he's distracted and he didn't hear me, so I'm going to ask it again. I said, how many of you want to go to heaven? Raise your hand. And everybody raised their hand except the little boy. He thought, maybe this kid is half deaf. Got a little closer to him, said, how many of you want to go to heaven when you die? Raise your hand. And everybody raised their hand except the little boy. And he said, little boy, don't you want to go to heaven? He said, yes, sir. Then why didn't you raise your hand? I thought you were getting up a group to go right now. We're saved by faith, not anything that we do. All the goodness that we do in God's sight, we're told in Isaiah, is like a filthy rag. Buy this filthy rag! It's fantastic! You'll hate it! God provided a perfect sacrifice on the cross to cover sin. It was His own Son. And if we put our faith and trust in Him we will be saved. And that's what gives us hope. Amen? Amen. We have peace, going back to Romans 5, 1 through 6, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into His grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. May the God of hope, may the God of hope fill you with all joy. Psalm 28, 7 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in Him, and He helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song, I praise Him. Have you ever been in a praise and worship 
either a concert or just a time in church where you just have so much joy, you are overflowing with it, and you can't help it, your hands just... All this means is I surrender everything. You ever get robbed? How many of you ever been robbed before at gunpoint? Oh, yeah, I got one in the back row. Yeah, me too. What's the first thing you do? You see the gun come out. You start backing up with your hands up. What are you saying? Uh, I surrender. Whatever you want, buddy, you got it. Just please don't pull that trigger. And when we raise our hands to the Lord, we're saying, praise God. I surrendered all, everything I am, everything I have, it's yours, Lord. And wow, I've been in so many praise and worship services, sometimes just the praise songs in a normal church service, and I start bawling like a baby. I made the mistake of saying one time I was bawling like an old woman. And all the women got upset with me. And I said, well, wait a minute. I didn't say anything about, you know, like my wife is an old woman, either though, even though I'm married to one. And then it was even worse. I, and I said, Rick, Rick, what do I do to get myself out of this hole? He said, quit talking. <laughs> Valuable lesson I learned from Rick that day. He says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy. My heart leaps for joy. And with my song, I praise him. Psalm 86, 4 says, Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. And then may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast. Because, why are they steadfast? Because they trust in you. When you have your trust and faith in Christ There is a peace. The Bible calls it the peace that passes understanding. Folks who don't have Christ in their lives would look at us and say, how in the world can you be at such peace when there's so much turmoil around you? It has nothing to do with me. It's because I have the peace that the Lord gives, that peace that passes understanding you will keep him in perfect peace. Those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Psalm 119, 165. That's a long chapter, isn't it? 165 plus verses. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. The old King James says, nothing will offend them. If you ever hear a Christian Say, you know, I was really offended. Point them to Psalm 119, 165 and say, where do you stand on that? Great peace have they which love thy law and nothing, nothing, nothing can offend them. We should be, as Christians, the least offended people in the world. You know that? We really should. Because we have the peace that God gives us. Back to Romans 5, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into His grace in which we now stand. We have peace with God. It's wonderful to have peace with another person, isn't it? Maybe a coworker, you get along so well. You're maybe a, like a brother or a sister or a grandma or a mom or dad. <laughs> it's great to have that kind of relationship where there's peace. And wouldn't it be great if all of the nations on earth could get along like that and have peace with one another? That'd be fantastic. Look at the money we would save. Wouldn't need a military. If all the nations were peaceful. And folks, one day that's coming. When Jesus reigns on this earth for a thousand years during the millennium, we're told that in Scripture. It's in prophecy. He will reign here for a thousand years. There will be no war. Boy, think of the money the governments are going to save. See, there is something to look forward to. We won't be taxed during the millennium. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him. How do you get the joy? How do you get the peace? You can't buy it. 
Oh, and aren't you glad about that? I don't have enough money to buy my joy and peace from God. And it doesn't take money. It doesn't take good looks. It doesn't take fame. And that's good because that's a three strike out on me. But as you trust in Him, you get the joy and peace. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding in all your ways. The King James says, Acknowledge Him. Wow. The New International Version says, Submit to Him. That takes on a whole different meaning, doesn't it? It's one thing to acknowledge Christ. It's another thing to submit. In every area of our life, we can be an acknowledger or a submitter. But only if we are a submitter will we have the joy and peace that Jesus promises us in His Word. As you trust in Him, in all your ways submit to Him and He will make your paths straight. Psalm 28, 7 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in Him, and He helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song I praise Him. You say, Preach, you already read that verse. I know, but it's got both trust and, uh, and joy in it. We don't get penalized for double dipping in the Word of God. Amen? <laughs> Psalm 37, 4 through 6 says, Take delight in the Lord. And He will give you the desires of your heart. Verse 5 says, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him. And He will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Commit. How committed are you? I'll tell you how committed I am. When that light is green and there's an intersection, my right foot goes down a little bit. And when it turns yellow, now there's a judgment to be made. Shall I press on the brake or shall I press on the gas? No matter what you do at that point, you are committed. If you have committed yourself to be on the gas, consequences be what they may be. Normally, I make it through the yellow light. <coughs> Knowing that the consequence could be red and blue lights behind me. Normally. To be committed is to say, no matter what happens, no matter what befalls me, I'm going for it. I'm committed to that path. To be committed to Jesus means that you're going to go for it in life with Him, no matter what comes, no matter if that light turns red or stays yellow. I'm going through that intersection. And let me tell you, there have been times in my life where that commitment has faltered, not because of him, but because of me. Looking around at my circumstances and getting angry with God. You let this happen in my life. I'm serving you. I've given my whole life to you, and look what you've done to me. Here's the earth. Here's Randy. You know, he has the power to just go. But he doesn't do that because he's a God of love and mercy and grace. And he gives us time to sort it out, and the Holy Spirit convicted me and brought me back. And I'm committed for the rest of my life. It doesn't matter what comes. I'm going through that light. 
I'm going through that intersection. I hope you feel the same way about Jesus today. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him. And He will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope. Psalm 119, 114 says, You are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your word. See, I don't put my hope and my trust in my fellow human beings because they'll fail me every time. I don't put my faith and my trust and my hope in preachers because preachers are human. And if they falter in their commitment to go through that intersection of life with Jesus, they're going to fail. They're going to mess up. And if we're looking to the preacher and putting our, our hope and our faith and our trust, and we've got the preacher up here on a, on, on a stand, an elevated stand, don't look to man, look to Jesus. Because this guy may fail you. And you'll get your heart broke. And you'll get your spiritual heart broke. And then you'll start wondering about your own commitment to the Lord well, wow, such a great man of God. He's out of the ministry now because of immorality. Well, what hope is there? Well, my hope is in Christ, amen? Not in the preacher. It's not in a denomination. My hope is in Christ. We talked about this in Sunday school, where denominations have started to get away from the Word of God. Oh, get away. They've run from the Word of God. The standard is over there. Now here is the denomination. That happened because they got away from the Word of God. They did not any longer be committed to the Lord, to His Word. Psalm 130, verse 5 says, I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in this Word I put my hope. His Word, I put my hope. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold unswervingly, unswerving, committed, straight, straight path. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Men will fail you every time. I've got time, I'll tell you a little story. This is a rabbit trail, it wasn't planned. I grew up in Lapeer, went to a church that the pastor had moved on, had uh, felt the God's call to go to another church, a bigger church that paid more. Okay, I'm going. <laughs> but he left on good terms. We, we loved him even after he left us high and dry. <laughs> the board, the... the the board was so eager, they were so, they wanted a pastor so badly that they brought in three candidates. They all preached for us, and the last one that came, they had a little meeting afterwards, and, and I'm saying, oh Lord, please let him pick this guy, because he's got a 14-year-old daughter, and she is, oh, she is really, really good looking, and I really, so that was my prayer. So they hired him. They didn't do a fact check. They didn't do a background check. They didn't do any kind of check. They just hired him on his word. A year later, the secretary says to her husband, who was a deacon, you know, it wasn't a free Methodist church I was raised in, Gerald, I'm looking at the records, and the pastor and his family never joined the church. Oh, well, that was probably just an oversight. We were so excited to have him, we forgot to, you know, hey, pastor, come on up here and join the church. Yeah, we forgot. Just send a letter to the church he came from and ask him for a letter of membership. So she did. A week later, she gets a letter. And in the letter, it said, we will not forward a membership for this man. He did not walk circumspectly in the world. He did not abstain from the appearance of evil and attached is a list of items that he borrowed from church members that have never been returned. i got to back up a little bit. When they accepted him as pastor, 
he said, now I'm going to move across the church into a mobile home, but I don't have room for all my stuff. Where can I store it? This was kind of before the age of every two miles you see a storage facility. People, just get rid of your stuff. Dad volunteered, said, well, you can keep it in my garage. It took up half the garage. Tables, chairs, ladders, you name it, it was in there. Guess what was on the list? Tables, chairs, chainsaws, just everything that was on the list was in Dad's garage. So, Mom and Dad, who had held this preacher in high regard, now did not hold him in high regard. And he wound up resigning, and who knows where he went. But you cannot put your faith and trust in men. Or women. Women are even worse. No, I won't say it. I, I've learned my lesson about talking about old women. I have learned it. The Lord has taught me well. So that you may overflow with hope. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Men are not faithful. Men can fail you at any time, so we need to trust in God. And then the last phrase. What time do you guys normally get done? About 1 o'clock? Because I've got two or three more sermons that I could bring. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The power of the Holy Spirit keeps you from falling downstairs. The power of the Holy Spirit is what gives us that boldness, that courage to be His witnesses. And think about it, folks. If we are not His witnesses, what will be the witness of Jesus Christ? Movies? TV, radio, newspapers, politicians, <laughs> politicians, <laughs> really? That'd be like down. We are his witnesses. He has chosen to use people and trust him and serve him to be his witnesses. And sometimes people just don't want to hear about the gospel. They don't want to hear about how great heaven is going to be and how quickly they're going to face that time of death. It's either heaven or hell, folks. There's no purgatory. I've read the entire Catholic Bible, and there's no purgatory in the Bible. It doesn't exist. The Bible says that the death of his saints, he takes joy in the death of his saints. Why is that? Because they're gone from here and there with him. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord when we leave this earthly tabernacle that is flawed. It has arthritis, especially in this joint right here. And the back is, is not as sturdy as it used to be, and it hurts. When we leave this earthly tabernacle, tell them about the good news, the gospel, the good news that Jesus died for your sin he rose from the dead. And if you accept him as your savior, you stop trying to be your own God. Well, I don't need anybody to tell me what to do. Well, you, then you are your own God. And you set your own rules for you. But that doesn't work. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. The creator of the universe said, there's one way to get to heaven. It's my way or the highway. You say, well, God's a tyrant. Hey, you know what? He's God. He can do whatever he wants. It's his way. 
And so when we follow His way, we will be witnesses of His love, of His faithfulness, of His goodness, and also of His judgment. And I think the church as a whole, not just the Free Methodist Church, the Church of Christ, the Bride, has fallen down on the job when we witness to people, oh, God loves you, He loves you just as you are. Pray this little prayer, and then you'll be saved, and then everything will will work out. You know, the Holy Spirit will instruct you as to what you're to do. And so they come away thinking, okay, God loves me. I ask God to save me, and everything's great. And I just heard this song on the radio, God loves me like I am. So I can just keep doing whatever I've been doing. I can be the same person I was. There's no change. There's no, no growth in Christ. There's no growth in my spiritual life, but that's okay because God loves me just like I am. Have we fallen down on the job or what? Now, people get upset. They don't want to be told what to do. Nobody likes rules. You got to go see Dave. It was 75 on the highway. My wife said, how fast are you going? I said, 75. (laughs) Nobody likes rules. Don't tell me what to do. A little granddaughter. We were watching her. She was just two years old. I said, Madison, pick up your toys. we got to go. She said, Poppy, no say. Two. You know what? Let me translate that for you. You know what she was saying? Shut up, old man. I'll do as I please. That's exactly what she was saying. And that's what the world says. God says, you must come my way. They say, shut up, God. I'll do it my way. Remember old Bing Crosby? I think it was Bing Crosby who sang that song, I'll do it my way. Yeah, not the Lord's way. If you're going to enter in, you have to go into that narrow gate, His way. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and all Samaria and unto the ends of the earth. I can't get to Botswana, Africa. But I know a missionary who's over there preaching the gospel. So I can support his ministry. See how that works? That's why we have missions. 2 Timothy 1.7 For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid. Well, I would tell my neighbor about Jesus, but I, I, just, I just don't like confrontation. You know, I, I don't want to make them mad at me. And so I'll just keep my mouth shut and not tell them the gospel. And when they die, they're going to go to hell. It's serious. It's not life-changing. It's eternity-changing when someone gets saved. Amen? For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power. If you don't have any power in your Christian life, start asking Him for it. And then when He moves in your heart to be His witness, witness. He gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Those are the things that should characterize our Christian life. When someone looks at me, I hope they can see Jesus' love and His character in me. Are you perfect, preacher? (laughs) Ask my wife. She could come up with a list and for sure verify I am not perfect. Don't try to be. don't, Don't pretend to be. I'm as human as anyone else. But there are commitments that I have made to the Lord that I hope I can keep that will keep me going right through that intersection of life holding His hand and with the power of God resting on me and my family. Boy, it's quiet in here. Am I supposed to quit now? It's quarter till. Not yet? I got another sermon, brother. But I did come to the last line of the verse, so we are done. So let's stand as we pray to be dismissed.
Our Father, we thank you so much for the love that you have for us so much. You look down on your creation and you didn't want heaven without us. And so you sent Jesus to die in our place to take our punishment for sin. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you that the Holy Spirit indwells us and he guides us into all truth so that we can have the joy and peace that only comes from knowing Jesus. I'd like us to pray a prayer together. If you're here this morning and you've never invited Jesus Christ into your life, I want to give you that opportunity, but I don't want to embarrass you. We're not going to have an altar call. But where you stand, I want you to pray in your heart. You don't even have to pray it out loud. Just pray it in your heart. Well, actually, I do want you to pray it out loud because I would like everybody to pray it out loud. And then someone who has never accepted Christ, when they pray that prayer, they won't be the only one praying out loud. So if you would pray after me, dear God, I know that I am a sinner. I want to thank you for sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross for my sins and to raise from the dead. And he's promised to prepare a place for me. Thank you for saving me. I repent of my sins and I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You look up here. It was a joy to be with you this morning. If you prayed that prayer, I hope you'll just pull me aside and, and tell me so I can pray for you. And I would encourage you to attend this church if you don't normally. This is a sound, Bible-believing church, and that's what we need, amen? We need more and more and more. Boy, the days as they get more crazy, we need to be relying on the Word of God as our guide. So, I guess I'll... I want to shake your hands as you leave, but I can't play the piano and do that. Sometimes I need a clone. So, I'll say you're dismissed, and then I want to shake your hand. You have